you may have to accept it. But in your case, I would say get it done probably at the end of their junior year in school, maybe, and have you know a, a child psychiatrist do the DSM four or five or whatever it's called now and have the diagnostic done. But don't they, if she wants accommodations for ACT, SAT, Absolutely. she needs it prior to that. Good point. Good point. If, and a physician can do that. A physician. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for ADHD. For ADHD, yeah. 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 A physician can do that. Most colleges are looking at three years. So. Okay. But that's a good point around the testing accommodations. At the post-secondary level, there is an overarching need for student self-advocacy and self-determination. I can't stress it enough, and I think if we, if Groves ever invites me back, we'll just talk an evening about those two skills and talking about putting together a portfolio. But that's the most critical thing parents you can do at IEP meetings. Besides having standard-based IEP goals, we already talked about, you're make sure that happens, and they're going to, you're just going to wonder where you got that information from. And then, the other thing is you want self-advocacy in that IEP. You want them to start demonstrating that they're working with your center. This is how I explained it. It can happen. Because if the school isn't going to help you, I mean, certainly mom and dad can work on that, but I think they should also do it. In other words, if your son or daughter is almost full-time in regular ed, what is a special ed teacher doing? What they, what they should be doing is addressing that, that area of self-advocacy and self-determination. At minimum, post-secondary education programs are required to offer reasonable accommodation and aids to qualified students. And again, that's the law. Supports and accommodations, here's even more to read. Colleges cannot charge students for reasonable accommodations necessary to provide equal access under 504. So in other words, if a college might say to you, well, it sounds like your son or daughter needs a note taker in college, that would be a great conversation to have to see what they'll do to accommodate that. And ask them, and I would just say it, I would say, well, you know, my son has this kind of disability deal, and, um, and he needs to have somebody check in with him or whatever it might be. How do you accommodate that? And then they'll say, well, how was it accommodated in high school? And then you're, you're probably going to say, well, he had an IEP and he had somebody helping him take notes. And then you're going to have a really interesting discussion as to what they feel their obligation might be. And I think it, it's never wrong to simply ask, could you please put in writing why my son or daughter can't have that accommodation because I'm new at this. Could you just kind of write that down and see what they say? Because I think to a certain extent, that, you know, colleges need to need to appreciate, and they do. There's more and more young people going to college has, you know, recognized needs, and they're all working through that. And they might have other. Well, we don't do note taking, but we do this. And they would say, well, that might work. But if but if you're working with somebody at that point in time, you really want to understand why they say they can't do something. All right. And I need to explain <laughs> is I work with hundreds of kids. Many have gone to college. I've had these meetings with college people, and my best approach has always been to ask, not very broke. And I just <laughs> and I just ask questions because I never ask them to say, "Well, here's you know the assistant director special." I never don't say that, Mom. <coughs> I'm just going to say, "Well, just tell me why won't this work?" And and many colleges well, and they have many programs, and we're going to talk later tonight about the programs, the colleges that do have accommodations, which are better than they've ever been. Skills such as the college experiences. Oh, this, the only reason I put this slide in is if you're, I know we had so many friends in IEP with, with my kids at IEPs. Why don't you just have all this stuff in your IEP? I want my son to have a goal on study skills, <coughs> asking for assistance, self-disclosing, advocating, and decision making. I want those five, uh, five goals. What do you think, team? See what they say. But who could say it's not necessary? If the pathway is is college or technical school, which of these five areas should we exclude? If he's on an IEP or she's on, which one should we exclude? None of them. They should all be in the IEP, right? Because again, if my son or daughter's on pathway one or two, they're probably doing fairly well in school. We have the accommodations in place. But that, but there's, there's a certain reality that's gonna kick in when they leave school. Here's the reality. 
they need those skills as well. <coughs> student responsibility. The student as an adult retains all rights and responsibilities. This was a uh, parent invited me to a meeting once at a college, and I said, Mom, you understand they're not going to talk to us. The only person they're going to talk to is your son. They're not going to talk to us. And where does that self-advocacy come into play at that very first meeting at that college when mom is doing all the talking? What do you think the impression is with a college counselor or the first person? Yikes. Kid didn't say a word. So it happens. You know, it's just, it really is the reality of what happens. So always keep, you know, so you know the pathways, and the pathways could be even pathway three, which is employment. Who's going to go apply for a job? You or your son. That's why he needs those skills. The student, not the parent, is the one who plans the program, presents the document, requests the needed accommodation, monitors all the effect the efficiency of the accommodations. Then I go through, and I won't go through this because I'm taking way too much time. I mentioned about eight keys to transition service. Any of these keys then, um, where the IEP must list measurable post-secondary goals with age-appropriate transition assessments. And that's just required. The student can clearly define his or her preferences. The pathways are a reference point. <coughs> so in other words, if you've talked about the pathways with your son or daughter, he or she should be able to talk about post-secondary options. What are your career goals? What are the things you'd like to accomplish in life? What interests you? Oh, here was, to ensure that post-secondary goals are measured and based upon age-appropriate transition assessments, you can have this goal in place. Mike, that was original, that was me. Mike will acquire the skills to apply to a two-year college, followed by specific objectives. Have your IP team write that goal and have them work on it. That's the goal. If your transition is, is pathway one or two, should this be a goal on the IEP? On the transition IEP, yeah. And so simple. What are the objectives? The objectives would be, Mike will develop a portfolio. Mike will develop, you know, he will be trained to, or he will be um, mentored through self-determination activities and self-advocacy activities. Summary of performance. This is, when your son or daughter graduates, the law requires a summary of performance. That document could be used to go to take to a college as evidence that your son or daughter has been served under special ed with an identified disability. So that summary of performance document, these are all the different elements that it should include, but that should be handed to you at your very last IEP meeting. Hopefully it's handed <coughs> to the young man or young woman. Can the SOP document be utilized by post-secondary disability services? It may, it may actually work. <laughs> Structuring schools for effective transition, effective transitions should include each of these. <coughs> and that universal design again is that idea where classroom teachers now are differentiating instruction in the classroom so that you have rigor in the curriculum for all students in your school. You will also have rigor in the life of the life <coughs> your son or daughter. And because they will be in an English class, let's say where certain accommodations need to be made, but those same standards that all students in that school are supposed to be striving to attain should also be the measurement by which you measure the success, the academic success of your son or your daughter. That's why the law says you'll have standard-based IEPs written. The standard is presented within the context of the IEP, and you will work towards meeting or addressing that standard. Opportunity standards is another way of looking at it. But again, it's, it's where the school itself looks at all of these different areas as being um, strategies that the school uses to support students with special needs. So it's the responsive curriculum, the individualized instruction, access to technology, etc. So simply what I tried to share with you today is is what this slide says, that we really are working towards um, a new, uh, we're graduating students into a new 
type of society where the jobs that were once funded under certain mechanisms from the federal government and the state government are no longer there. That we really should be striving to say to school systems that we want our sons or daughters to be challenged within the regular ed curriculum. We expect that. We also expect the schools to be working with our sons or daughters so that they can be more um, self-reliant on themselves and not on other people to help give them direction when they leave school.